With me today is Crisis Group Senior Iran Analyst Ali Baez, and he is here to talk about the Iran nuclear talks. We have a deal, but it still needs to be implemented, and one of the most important things is how the two sides are going to be able to sell the deal back home. There are many people in the United States who think that Iran should have no enrichment capacity, and yet in, that would be an absolutely impossible idea to sell in Iran, and even the fact that it's being limited is a problem in Iran. How would you suggest the two sides go back home to, se to sell this deal? Yeah, well, this deal is as fragile as the forces against it are formidable. And selling it back home is going to be an extremely difficult challenge. Uh, it is obviously a negotiated solution, and like all negotiations, uh, the outcome is never ideal because it's a compromise by both sides. But uh, at the end of the day, if you compare it to the alternatives, it puts everybody in a better place. Uh, when it gets to enrichment, for example, it's true that ideally Iran would have zero enrichment. Uh, but that is no longer possible. It, it wasn't even possible in 2005 uh, when Iran was negotiating uh, with uh, the three European countries. And at the time, Iran only had 167 centrifuges. Now, 10 years later and 20,000 centrifuges later, that goal is just simply unattainable. Uh, so the best alternative is to constrain the enrichment program and put it under rigorous monitoring so that you make sure that it's only used for peaceful purposes. What about research and development? Where do you think that the deal has fallen on, on that question? Well, research, research and development is very important for the Iranians because it, it is one of the main pillars of the entire narrative that has been created in Iran around the, uh, the, the nuclear um, uh, energy program, uh, which is uh, scientific progress and insistence on having uh, enrichment on Iranian soil and be able to continuously uh, improve and enhance the efficiency of centrifuges. Uh, Iran has accepted some limitations as part of this agreement. It's normal, it's natural, because otherwise there is no way that they can uh, restore international trust in the peaceful nature of their program. So both sides have moved, both sides have shown flexibility, and that's the only way that one can have a negotiated solution. How about the length of time of the deal? Iran wanted to get this over and done with and, and, and be free of, of, of all the restrictions that have been placed on it, and yet the United States wanted it to be very long. How do you think that the two sides have managed to square that circle? The duration is, again, one of uh, the prime examples of how both sides have compromised and have agreed on the middle ground. The Iranians wanted to have a very short deal of three to seven years. Um, so that it would be done either in the first term of President Rouhani or in his second term. Um, whereas the P5 plus one wanted a deal that goes on for 20 to 30 years. The, the current duration of 10 to 15 years is really the middle ground. Uh, and again, it's more than enough time uh, for the IAEA to be able to resolve its outstanding issues with, with Iran, to resolve the so-called uh, possible military dimension of, uh, of Iran's nuclear program and make sure that the entire activities and material in, in Iran are in civilian use. What about the Arak reactor? From the outside perspective, this plutonium reactor looked one of the most dangerous possible routes to a bomb for Iran. Uh, from the US perspective, it should have been closed down. And from an Iranian perspective, it, you know, why would anyone be allowed to mess with it? So it seems that Arak will stay open. How is that a good thing? Well, this is again one of those examples of how uh, scientific innovation can help diplomacy. Uh, scientists from national labs in the United States and, Iranian, uh, and their Iranian counterparts were able to figure out a solution where the Iraq reactor will remain open and will actually remain a heavy water reactor, but the amount of plutonium that it produces is diminished from about 10 kilograms per year, which is enough for one nuclear weapon per year, to less than one kilogram per year. Uh, and again, this is, uh, I think, the most logical solution that one could bring out of uh, uh, the disagreements over uh, uh, Iraq, because Iran has spent an enormous amount of time, energy, and uh, capital on the Iraq reactor. So it remains open, it remains a heavy water reactor, but it's basically defanged, and it's no longer a threat uh, when it gets to uh, uh, proliferation concerns. If there's one symbol of uh, the Iran's nuclear program, it's that very deep uh, bunker in Ferdo where all, all this activity is taking place. How can it be that that continues working and that the world can feel safe that there is not something sneaky going on? 
Fordo was always an insurance policy for Iran. Uh, when Iran was being threatened uh, that its uh, facilities will be attacked either by Israel or the United States. Now that we have a diplomatic solution, that threat is no longer there. Uh, so Iran doesn't need Fordo to remain an enrichment facility. Uh, both sides have agreed to turn it into a research and development facility. So again, it's a middle ground solution. Fordo will remain open, but it will be repurposed as a research and development center under rigorous monitoring by the IAEA. The suspicions of the world of Iran are centered on, for instance, the IAEA investigation into possible military dimensions in the past. And the United States in the past has also said, we, we need to resolve all this before we can move forward. Whereas Iran has said, come on, that this is the past. Let's talk about the future. It seems that both sides have got something. Can you tell us a little more about that? This is one of those cases when uh, one can refer to what Henry Kissinger used to say, that people need to be able to distinguish between the urgent and the important. Uh, the, the urgent is Iran's current nuclear activities. The important is what it has been done in the past. Uh, the negotiators have not ignored uh, the IAEA's concerns, but they have not interfered in the IAEA's work, which might take a few years uh, for this investigation to get completed. So the issue is that Iran has promised that it will cooperate with the IAEA to resolve um, uh, uh, the outstanding questions that the agency has. Uh, and it will only gain its status as a, as a normal member of the MPT once those problems are resolved. But the negotiators have not allowed that, uh, the, the past to take a, uh, uh, the, the future and the current agreement as hostage. Um, uh, and I think that's, that, again, was a logical thing to do. Uh, but again, that is a process that is going to take some time. Uh, and Iran's nuclear dossier will never become fully normal as long as those issues are unresolved. So Iran has, by its own, has a motivation to cooperate with the IAEA and resolve those problems. Finally, the question of sanctions. A lot of people think that the only reason that Iran came to the table was because of these sanctions and that they should be maintained until the last moment, while Iran has been suffering badly from being excluded from world markets in many ways and wants that to be removed straight away. Now, neither side seems to have got what they wanted. How is this going to make the, uh, the deal tenable and sustainable? I think it's wrong to believe that sanctions were the most important reason that Iran came to the negotiating table, but it's also wrong to believe that sanctions were not part of the motivation that Iran came to the negotiating table. Now, we in the international community and especially in the non-proliferation community are not used to using sanctions as a bargaining chip at the negotiating table in a real quid pro quo. Um, and this is the first time that such a, uh, an exchange basically is happening. It is happening in a gradual, incremental fashion. Uh, sanctions are first going to be suspended, uh, and then over time, as Iran proves its commitment to the agreement, sanctions will gradually be terminated. But again, a compromise solution was found in a way that Iran would see uh, a real tangible economic reprieve as a result of sanctions relief in the beginning of the agreement, but the P5 plus one will also be able to maintain some leverage to make sure that Iran doesn't violate the agreement and will uh, fulfill its commitments uh, down the road. Um, so that's why, again, we start with suspension and we move to partial lifting and uh, full lifting towards the end of the agreement. Ali Baez, Crisis Group Senior Iran Analyst, thank you very much. Thank you.